Dr. Zardambar. He's going to be speaking on mitigating business risk with application security. Joe is the Director of Software Experience in the National Cybersecurity Division of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He leads government interagency efforts to shift the security paradigm away from the patch management and towards the workforce education, competency diagnostic capabilities, and security enhanced development and acquisition practices. He is also a Texan. He received two of his undergraduate degrees from the, uni from the University of Texas, right here in Austin. That's why I asked the question about what are we doing to make sure it gets into computer science and MIS programs. So everybody, let's give a big round of applause for Joe Zimbabwe. It's nice to be able to come back out here, uh, and I like coming back to the, the Hill Country. But uh, I have to tell you, I, I'm wearing this because October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It's, it's about helping all citizens secure their part of cyberspace. And when you think about it, my department, the Department of Homeland Security, was actually stood up as a result of perhaps the most defining event that happened to us. It's called 9-11. But when you think about 9-11, there will be people say, well, we needed to build more resilient buildings put up. But what the reality is, we found out that people were using devices, it was then, it was our air transportation system, in ways that we had never intended. People weren't thinking about how aircraft could be used in that. So consequently, systems that had been determined to be safe, that were not secure, either in development or in operations, were now used in many ways, so from a public safety perspective, many people died simply because we weren't thinking about security when safety was there. So what's been changing in this as far as, it, it comes down to the fact that today we have a lot of statutory guidance for safety, but not so much in the area of security. And I will tell you that is all you have to simply do for people who say we're delivering safe systems, resilient systems, or we're just, Delivering systems that protect our privacy. If you've not done a cybersecurity vulnerability analysis, I contend that's an invalid claim. So let's understand the needs. And, and this is why it's a very good marriage, I view, with OWASP and the types of things that we're doing. Because when we look at our community collaboration activities, OWASP is one of those important stakeholders in this who help advance what we're trying to do in this space. In fact, if you go to our website, we will reference many of the OWASP practices. And they, the resources that the OWASP has available. So I commend that. So let's let's start off from a, a background of understanding <coughs> and anything that's going to ever address security. Let's go back to the basics. The art of war, Sun Tzu, it says one who knows the enemy and knows himself will not be endangered in hundreds of engagements. One who does not know the enemy but knows himself will sometimes be victorious, sometimes be with defeat. But one who neither knows the enemy nor himself will invariably be defeated in every engagement. Now the message behind this is that an appropriate defense can only be established if one knows the weaknesses and how it will be attacked. Now I mention that because there are some people who say what we need to do is focus on mitigating or eliminating threat. We'll get over that. You, the, the threat is actually growing exponentially. But what we can do is understand what that threat is. How are our systems being exploited? Either from malicious insiders or basically in some cases it's just unintentional consequences that we have. But what we can control is the attack surface. We can control the attack vector based on how we develop and deploy our systems. So let's focus on those things that we can control and then seek to understand those things that we cannot, that we have to, it's the environment that we're in. And we know that that environment is one of which it's growing all the time, everything's interconnected, and our weaknesses are actually, because somebody else brought it in, the, the weakest link syndrome. And we hear of constant ex exploits. It's in the news, and it's been there for years. And we just kind of shake our heads, yeah, yeah, well, it was enabled through that. But there are people who say, we need to change the laws. We need to start doing something about that. But you know what? And, and by the way, there is a lot of pending legislation in this space. Not sure what will come out of it because 
Well, there's a lot of political pressures both ways. But the bottom line is, I contend it's not legislation. It's not changes in the law that's going to change this. Because we actually have laws in place that we're not using to the full extent that we could. What's going to change that mentality is what the recent surveys have been telling us. It's the hackers who are going to motivate changes in behavior. Because it's ultimately, we, the enterprise owners, have to do something about that. So it's either criminal hackers or state-sponsored hackers, but because simply the fact is enterprise free markets aren't changing that. Now, I will have to tell you, coming in from the Department of Homeland Security, I have a different focus on this. And it's one that actually everyone here has a, a stake in that, because everything that we do is interconnected on this space. I, I'm retired from the military, and so as a military officer, I will tell you that we had some lot, we still have challenges to the Department of Defense and the military services. But at least the Department of Defense owns and operates all of their assets. The Department of Homeland Security has been tasked with the responsibility of securing our nation's critical infrastructure, for which the federal government does not own or operate. We're responsible. And now when you think about critical infrastructure, a lot of people think of the physical assets that are out there, all the way from our our power grids, our banking and finance, all the things that we have in there. But when you start understanding just how we operate these systems, how they are enabled, we see a lot of need for secure software applications across the board, every one of these, and we're interconnected. And we have industrial control systems that are 100% software. You got a question? Are you able to post these? Are these public? I will. I'll give you the PDF for us. So what we've understood is that there's some critical considerations of this. That software is the core constituent of modern products and services. It enables our functionality and provides our rich, rich robustness to be able to evolve to change, changing requirements, everything about that. However, we have a dramatic risk in our mission due to increasing interdependence of software. We have dramatic risk because of size and complexity obscures testing. We, we simply don't understand what we have. Now, some of you can say, well, we do. You're getting a better sense of that. But do you really? Because when we test for things, we talk, you know, we, we've got the OWASP top 10. Or I'll be talking about the top 25 common weaknesses. There are things that we can do to help focus on those things that are most critical. But ultimately, how many people really know everything of all the software that's running on your systems and what it does? But then we run into the problem of outsourcing and the use of unvetted software supply chain. All of a sudden, we're bringing a lot of products that we really don't know what they do, who produced it, what intent they have, our fundamental capabilities. And I'm going to come back to this as far as a supply chain risk mitigation activity. Because when I say unvetted software supply chain, not only do we not know the provenance of pedigree of this, it comes down to the fact that if we don't know who these people are, we don't even know if the companies had fundamental capabilities of delivering secure products and services. So consequently, we start funding more things, and we, we tend to go back to domestic suppliers because we feel more comfortable with them. But we have not necessarily addressed the need if those companies don't fundamentally get it from a security perspective. Reuse. It's always been viewed as a great software engineering technique. Reusing it. And, and it's, it's great. The problem is reuse of legacy systems, the so legacy software, they were developed in, in a time when people didn't understand you're going to put it on other platforms or being interoperable with other applications or certainly web-facing. You know, all of a sudden you understand we're getting a lot of unintended consequences and, and you identified that earlier in the presentation. We've got a lot of legacy systems out there. That's not going away, so we've got to understand that. So when we talk about software assurance, we're really talking about anything that can be exploited because there will be some people who say, well, this all we need to do is focus on Mitigating and getting rid of all those defects in software. Well, you'd be mostly right, because many of the defects that are there are the things that get exploited. The challenge is, most of those defects you can't prove where they put in there maliciously, but what we really know is most people were, you know, I'll use a technical term, they were clueless when it came to <laughs> developing secure products and services. But what we're finding is the area of malware, those intentional vulnerabilities. Now, most people think of malware in terms of, that's an operational problem. It gets in there after the fact. Actually, what we're finding is that more and more malware is showing up in software under development. Before it gets deployed, it's been pre-installed. Now, does that mean that the developers had malicious intent? Actually, what we found in many instances is that developers were unaware that they were bringing in 
code that actually had malware already in it. Uh, I'll, I'll use a real, well, I'll, I'll come to a simple example later on with that. But understand that the context here is we're looking at exploitable software that can often be independent of intent. It's just that we end up getting exploitable software in there. So when we talk about software assurance, we're looking at the entire range of what's in there. Because most people think of in terms of products. Those are the fundamental building blocks, the operating systems, the applications. We've moved the technology stack beyond that to platforms and, and frameworks. But what we're really focusing on, if we're going to really address the risks that are posed by this, is we have to address the software development lifecycle and our supply chains. So software assurance is focused on secure software components, security in the software development lifecycle, as well as software supply chain risk management. Why is it that we focus on software? Well, you see, most of the people you deal with don't care about software. In fact, the only time they ever even talk about it is when you find out, well, we were explo exploited because this software. That's the only time they even care about it. And many people will say, well, I don't touch software, therefore I'm not responsible for it. We're going to talk about what we do in the supply chain and how we can actually influence that. But, and it depends on which report you read, but you realize that anywhere between 75 to 90% of all enterprise breaches are at the application level. Now people will say, well, wait a minute, we've installed, we, we put in the, the security controls on our operating systems and the applications that are there. That's great. But that's the equivalent of putting padlocks on screen doors and feeling secure. Now, don't get me wrong, you have to put on the padlocks, but most of the people are hacking are simply not trying to break your padlocks. And so that's why we're saying functional correctness must be exploit, uh, exhibited even when software is subjected to abnormal and hostile conditions. Most testing today does not discover exploitable software weaknesses because that was not their role. That's not what the testing was looking for. So we have to change that mindset. We have to arm them with tools. And I'm going to tell you, we have to arm not just the testers and the QA people, we have to arm the developers with these tools as well. So in an era riddled with asymmetric cyber attacks, any claims about system reliability, integrity, or safety must include provisions for the built-in security, whatever software enables us. And so our program was actually set up in the Department of Homeland Security to focus on public-private collaboration to promote security and resiliency in software throughout the life cycle. We're focused on reducing exploitable software weaknesses by addressing means to more routinely uh, develop, deliver, and deploy, as well as acquire resilient products. And so we've been serving as a public-private forum, and I'm going to be inviting you to get involved with that. OWASP is already engaged with us on that, but you can participate as well. If nothing else, you can go online and look at that, or you can give us input online. You can come to our forums, which are free to attend. But we are providing a lot of collaboratively developed material. I'm going to give you the URLs that you can go to for that. Everything we're talking about is free for download. You can take advantage of it now. We're providing input and criteria for leveraging international standards. Now, why is it that we look at standards? Because I know many of your organizations will say, we don't use standards. Really? It says, well, the, the reality is what we're finding out is that many people who are involved in your engineering process groups, they are looking to models and standards to say, what is it that we should be doing? And you put those into your enterprise process assets. Most of your practitioners have no clue where these, these practices came from. They don't need to know. The point is, at some point, some customer might ask you, are you ISO conformant? Are you CMMI? Or, they're going to ask for that. And if you can show that thread of traceability, that's good. But why is it we use standards, our models? It's because they become the language of commerce. It is the way that suppliers talk to customers. It is the way that industry speaks to government. It is the way that insurance companies deal with the, those who they insure. You use standards. Because you don't say, give me all your practices. I say, I'm conformant with this standard. That speaks to these material. But we also, and I spend a lot of my program dollars, on enabling software security automation and measurement. And we do that by focusing on common indexing and reporting schemes for malware, exploitable software weaknesses, and common attacks that target software. And I'm going to briefly talk on it. Yes? Is there any effort in that to make the metadata machine central, like the semantic web? There, there is. I, if we can talk afterwards about that. The, the reason that we're, we're doing this is to really come to a point of unambiguously talking about code behavior. And our challenge today is that we don't have common reporting formats. We didn't have in the past, but we now have that. The common weaknesses, maybe some of you have heard, well, you've heard about the top 10 OWASP ones, but what is leveraged in that is the top 25 common weaknesses. 
And the reason we put those out is to help those who are in development as well as acquisition organizations to target the most egregious exploitable weaknesses. The reason we target that, it becomes an educational tool, a training tool, because every one of these are preventable. Every one are preventable. And now, some of them, I have to tell you, are not just code, they're actually at the design level. So static code analysis by itself is not going to detect all these. We've had the discussion that not all static code analyzers are created equal. They don't all do the same thing. So it does often take a toolkit to be able to do this. So I've been managing, through our program, we do the malware attribute enumeration and classification. We do the common weakness enumeration as well as the common attack pattern enumeration and classification. These uh, are to supplement the things that most, of, some of you may already know about, CVEs, common vulnerabilities and exposures. We now have over 45, excuse me, about 44,000 CVEs. What these represent is I can tell you after a fact which window did they break into, you know, what, how were you exploited, how were you breached? Well, how nice that is. Wouldn't you like to know the root causes of those? Of those 44,000 CVEs, there's less than 1,000 CWEs, the root causes. And we can actually prevent those as opposed to reacting to we were breached again. And that's what we're trying to do is being proactive about this. And the reason for having the common attack patterns, it says if you have that weakness, this is how you're going to be attacked. The malware is out there. How, how does it take advantage of that, that attack pattern? And so it helps us prioritize what we should work on first. Saying all this, it's like it gets it within the context of our supply, how we buy things. Most people think it's fairly cut and dry. I'm a customer, I'm going to buy from a supplier. Well, it turns out it's a little bit more fuzzy than that relationship. What we're really doing is buying from that supplier supply chain. And we're hoping, because we can't really trust, that the supplier is actually mitigating the risk all throughout here uh, before they pass things on to the program office, the buying office. And, and really is hoping. Now, like I said, they, they reuse things, they, they, they buy another company, they buy capability, they outsource. If you follow the thread, it turns out they're, they're going to some suppliers who have people developing the software who we would not let into our building. But we'll just go ahead and take their software. You understand you know, if we're not checking that. Now, understand that this idea, though, that says, oh, if it's foreign, it's bad. No, 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 don't, don't assume that. It <coughs> could assume that there are certain sources that may require us to do a, a domestic risk mitigation strategy. We're not saying we're not going to take offshore, because guess what? In a global economy, virtually all software is somewhere it's had a global touch. And so that's, that's not going to be the, the solution. But, the challenge is simply bringing it back on shore is also not going to fix it if we don't know if the suppliers have fundamental capabilities of delivering secure products and services. So consequently, five years ago, the law changed. Within the federal acquisition uh, regulations we have, supply chain introduces risk to American society that relies on the federal government for essential information and services. And so it literally changed on the role of and focused on contractors and security as federal agencies outsource various IT services. Now everybody's familiar with cloud computing, and we're kind of moving to that direction. And our, our challenge space is, if, if you don't think people were addressing software security in the past when we were buying software, now that you're buying services, what's likely you're going to do that? And what is cloud computing? Software as a service, SOA, service-oriented architecture, and all these infrastructure as a service, what do they all have in common? Well, they're implemented in software that sold the services. So we have to still keep our eye on the ball here for that. And this isn't just true for the federal government. Enterprises do this across the board as well. And you always make that make or buy decision. And even when you're buying things, you often have people in-house who are doing that glue code, making things fit together. That's the best place to reach an organization is that glue code because they're just trying to make things work together. And so I know your organizations focus on risk management because we understood that you can't be 100% secure. But when you focus on risk management and, and the names of your processes and practices, this very much depends on where you sit, depending on what is important to you. But you see, enterprises have a lot of regulatory compliance, a changing threat environment. They have to make a business case. We can't fund for everything, so you, you make trade-offs. At the program level, the project level, they focus on cost schedule and performance. Now, you're hoping that because we have performance that we're meeting the needs of the enterprise. Well, that's not so much so. It's, in fact, it's what happens at most project level, it's what's on contract. What do we put on the statement of work that you have to work down? 
Now you were using examples of what we're doing at University of Texas, you've got a project that you're being responsive to the enterprise. And, and I think that's the key link. That's what, if we're going to make a difference here, we have to look at the purchasing organization or the project level to say, how are we representing the needs of the using organization? And the way we do that is that when somebody says, but I can't do all of this right now, who is the one who's saying it's okay to wait? Who is the risk owner? Because a supply side, the risk is not on there. It's a, if I pass something that's exploitable onto the acquisition organization, is the supplier at risk? No. Is the acquisition organization at risk? No. The enterprise is at risk. So who's making that waiver decision about what we is okay to move on? So it traverses both the enterprise and program management interests. And what we're finding is in supply chain is that we're getting a lot of people who've taken their eyes off the ball in this case. It's we're finding out that it's beyond physical security. We're getting fake and counterfeit products. Many of you have heard about the Cisco routers, the fake routers. When you think about the fact that we're able to have fake Cisco routers put on some key networks, how easy was that? This is stuff that you can look at and touch. If we can put fake hardware products, how easy is it to get exploitable software inside those products? And so you understand that this is a, a big issue. So we do have a problem with deliberately embedded malicious functionality, but what we're finding is that a lot of exploitable software is uh, was unintended. And I, I basically think in terms of it's poor manufacturing hygiene. What do I mean by that is, what, how many of you have those digital picture frames at home? You know what I'm talking about either. And you know, the, you put that USB drive in there to download your pictures. Well, we found out some of those, when you plug that in, it downloaded malware onto your computer. And you go, oh my goodness, they must have had malicious intent. But then you took the exact same copies of that up, and very few of them had that on there. Well, what, what's going on here? You go back to the manufacturing plant, and it turns out that, in this case, it was the test computer that had it. You know how you randomly test some products as they go out? Well, it was only the test computer that had it on there. So only those products that were tested had the malware installed in it. Poor manufacturing hygiene. Now, somebody, that guy should have been fired because he was out there playing games on something and downloaded it. I said, actually, that was a great training opportunity. Now, you don't want to get rid of somebody like that because he's now learned, hopefully. But if he does it again, now you go ahead and fire him. But, you know, we, we go through a lot of training opportunities here. But our challenge is the failure to use those manufacturing capabilities to design and build secure products. But resuppliers are the ones who are actually putting us very much at risk here as well. And so one of the things that I was encouraged, you know, by what OWASP is doing, looking at security facts, because we're looking at a need for rating schemes associated with software. We need rating schemes for those products that must be supported by automation, standard-based rules for aggregation and scaling, verifiable by independent third parties, labeling to support various needs. Security could be different than dependability, but meaningful and economic for, for both consumers as well as suppliers. Now, why is it that we don't have these? You realize that we've had food labels for over 10 years. We've had, for more than a decade, we've had them. But it's only been recently that we've seen consumers actually making more informed decisions about what they're buying. And only recently, now, the federal government's starting to regulate based on what it is. It's evolved over time, but we've had it in place. So why is it that we can't do that for software? I contend that we can. And so we're teaming with organizations like OWASP, but I'm teaming this also with the National Institute for Standards and Technology. We'd like to see software labels. But we also need to have rating schemes for our suppliers who are providing the software products and services. And those must be standard-based or model-based frameworks that support process improvement and enable benchmarking of organizational capabilities. And we need credential programs for, for the professionals who are involved in developing software and delivering it. You realize if you go into a test lab today, no lab has a requirement for any certification or credential associated with software testers. And in fact, if you go into it, most of the time the testers are the guys who are not the best developers, right? It's like, this is your training opportunity. You get to be a tester. So we, we have to pay attention to that. So what if we actually change this paradigm and, and rethought about what we would do? What if the federal government, in collaboration with industry and academia, actually changed the mindset show? That we actually started thinking about it and, and raised expectations for product assurance when it came to software in terms of integrity and security. It means that we help to advance more comprehensive diagnostic capabilities, 
uh, collaboratively advance the use of software security measurement and benchmarking schemes, and promoted the methodologies and tools to enable security to become a normal part of business. How many times have you heard people say, well, security's hard? And therefore, they don't even get started. It's just like, well, we need to make it easier for them. We have to have the tools that we can automate many of these things for. But what if our acquisition managers and our users actually factored in software, and particularly the software supply chain, as part of their trade space for mitigating this? Again, you're never going to be 100% secure, but until you start paying attention to it, start asking questions about it, you're not going to get that. So we have to have information about supplier process capabilities, and we have to have information about evaluating products. That's our challenge. Even large federal agencies do not have the wherewithal to fully test all software that keeps coming in. So why is it that we can't have software that has been somehow evaluated and rating schemes are put out there so people can buy with a little bit more trust? But what if our suppliers actually delivered quality products with the requisite integrity and actually made assurance claims about software safety, security, and dependability? That would be interesting, wouldn't it? It means we'd have to have relevant standards to be used from which to base the business practices and assert the claims. We'd have to have qualified tools to be used throughout the software lifecycle to enable both developers and testers to mitigate the security risk. We'd have to have standards and qualified tools to be used by, uh, to evaluate the software by independent third parties. And we'd have to have the workforce with the requisite knowledge and skills. All of this is focused on enabling more transparency and making informed decisions about software we're bringing into our enterprise. And so we have been focusing on that. That's what our program has been on doing. It's through public-private collaboration. And we're putting this information on the websites and, uh, and sharing that with others. Uh, our Build Security End website is primarily focused on uh, making software security a normal part of software engineering. But our software assurance community resources and information clearinghouse is for the broader stakeholder community. And we actually include acquisition and outsourcing guidance. We've got information about tools. Um, and education as well. And one of the things that we recognize is the fact that with all the vast material that's out there, sometimes people just don't want to pick it up. It seems to be too overwhelming. So we went to pocket guides. And I literally mean pocket guides. That make it, we focus on different topics. Software assurance and acquisition and outsourcing were the first ones that we had that deal with software assurance and acquisition and contract language, as well as software supply chain risk management and due diligence. I'm going to actually cover some of that material there. But that was to help our buying decisions, to be more informed about what we do. And then in the area of development, the first one that we put out was key practices for mitigating the most egregious exploitable software weaknesses. It focused on the top 25 common weaknesses. It then said, here's the associated attack patterns. And it includes with it the mitigating practices. That, to make sure that you're not going to have that in place. One of the things that we're doing, and we're going to come out with a new top 25 in March of next year, and I'm inviting you as a community to collaborate with us because, not surprisingly, the last two years that we've done the top 25 CWEs, they've been web-based applications. That's been the, the primary focus. But we know that there are people in industrial control systems who say, well, that's not so applicable to us. There are people in real-time embedded systems who say that's not so applicable. But then there's these endpoint computing devices. That There's a lot of overlap in some of these, but there's a lot of differences. So we're going to have different views of these top 25s, and with those, the common attack patterns, and with those, also, the mitigating practices. Because, as I said, every one of these are preventable. Now, some people will say, well, what about the others? Because you have about 825. What about those others? I will tell you the way CWE's built, you're actually picking up much more than 25. But the point is, by focusing on the top 25, you are actually addressing more than 80% of the exploits that really go in there. And, and it helps people get started. And when people say, what about the others? I said, what about them? You don't know anything about any of them today. So why not just get started on the ones that are most egregious there? So we can do something. But we also know that this is an education and training issue. And so we've now been teaming with organizations to embed these practices in their training and certification programs. ISC Square, QAI, SAMS, there's been many organizations that actually do this part of their training and certification. ISC Square just came out with their Certified Secure Software Lifecycle Professional, the CSSLP. And that's been out there for about a year now. And so that's so we have a, a pocket guide on that saying here's the different ones that are out there. So the idea was to have these so that we can make it easier. <coughs> Even software security testing, this will help you get started on that if you haven't been focused on it. The idea is to help people get started. They give you references to where the more details are. 
And in the, in the case of the two acquisition pocket guides, the source is what we actually, through community collaboration, was on software assurance and acquisition mitigating risks to the enterprise. It's been out there now for two years. And this has been published through the National Defense University. We actually use this in several courses taught within the federal government through the Information Resource Management College or the Defense Acquisition University. It's a free uh, downloadable document. You can use that. Uh, within the pocket guides, the way we, we focus was take the life cycle perspective because we wanted to be agnostic, meaning if you're a DOD organization, you've got one life cycle. If you're a, a, another federal agency, you've got another. If you're focused on ISO, if you're, there's different life cycle models out there. We didn't care. We took an agnostic perspective. Everyone has to go through planning, contracting, implementation, and then follow-on phase. And we said, when you're in those different phases of acquisition, here's what you can do to mitigate risks that are associated with it. The key part was, I said, if you're going to get do nothing else with that document, go to Appendix D, which is our due diligence questionnaires that deal with COTS proprietary software questionnaire, COTS open source. By the way, for those of you who don't figure that out, some people think that it's either COTS or it's open source. By, by, law, by definition within the law, open source is considered commercial off the shelf. So keep that in mind. Our custom software, uh, and we've got another term, it's GOTS, which is government open source that's out there, but also software services. And let me give you an example of how we're doing that. The way that we constructed the, the tables on there, we, we listed the software assurance concern categories. We went through that all the way from your, your history, all the way down to security services and monitoring. Service confidentiality policies is important, especially when we go more to services. And so if you understand that, but then we listed the risk and the purpose for the questions because sometimes people didn't fundamentally understand, why, why do I care about that? So we listed it. We listed the, the individual risk, we said, here's the purpose for why you would ask the question. Uh, my intent was not to go through that, but to say, that's how the this is, you can go to the document and use that. It's a great teaching tool to help people understand that. It's a great way of going to upper management and saying, this is why we care. Because it's in a business context why we care about these things. And as an example, let me give you some questions that you would have, or what it came down to, uh, some that you may have not been asking. Uh, especially when you're buying proprietary software. Question number 11 and 12. Does the license or contract restrict the licensee from discovering flaws or disclosing details about software defects or weaknesses with others? In other words, is there a gag rule? And people say, what? What do you mean? We're actually finding that there is, it's standard contract language now. When you hit that I accept button in the EULA, you just said, <laughs> I do not have the right to determine if there's any exploitable software. And further, some of them say, you don't have the right to seek third-party counsel to figure out, what do I do about this? And then people say, well, it's just standard contract language. Why are we accepting that? Especially if you're paying for somebody to, to develop the software for you. And is the level of security where the software was developed the same as where the software will operate? I won't give you all the history where we've got very real reasons why we ask that question. You're going to deploy it into a secure environment, but it's open with their it's being, and it's being developed by people who you really don't want to have access to what it's going to. So it's a series of questions, and not all questions would be asked of all of them. In other words, if you're buying cuts, proprietary open source or custom code, there's different questions. You can either apply all of them. Now, here's a foot stomper, though. If you are not going to make a discernment regarding the outcome of that question, in other words, independent of how they answer it, you're, you're going to make a, a buyer decision anyway. Why put the suppliers through all the angst of answering these questions? I want to use the questions that really mean something to you. Because these are all about understanding your potential risk exposure. That's why we ask the question. And, and there are some cases that the supplier will either be unwilling or unable to answer the question. Now, does that mean you're not going to use that person's software? No. You're going to, you can simply say, all right, that represents a risk to me because I don't know. If you had a competing product out there, who you now know all about that, now there's other trade-offs that you're making. The point is, it makes you a more informed buyer. But more and more, we're going to hosted applications. As I said, with software as a service, SOA, and now cloud computing. These are all services. They're hosted applications. So what are you asking? Because this is a case where it's almost like we're giving it to somebody else. 
So you really need to be asking the questions. And like who configures and, de and de deploys the servers? Are the configuration procedures available for review, including documentation of all registry settings? Uh, what are the agents or scripts executing on servers and hosted applications? Are there potential for reviewing the security of these scripts and agents? See, if, if you weren't thinking about this, would you even ask for that when you're trying to do a contract? And certainly, would you put it in your service level agreement with whoever you're going to do a contract with? The idea is, address it front on, because if you discover after you've been on contract with them for a year, and it's like, and you didn't ask for it up front, and you didn't put it in your service level agreement, you don't get it. Unless it's going to cost you a lot extra, because now they got you. And so these are some of them. But I, I contend that what we need to do, and that's why I'll, I'll come to OWASP, I'll come to all of you. What are other things that we should be asking? We're seeking more examples from what I view as a security aware community. And OWASP would be one of those who are very secure. Relevant to deliberate actions taken, controlled, or preventable. There are some suppliers that say, I didn't know. Well, we just didn't know. So ask this question. Of the software you just delivered to me, did you disable any of the, the compiler warning plans? I'll look at you. Number one, some of them say they don't know. But you know, I, I would say, well, go, let's go back to that. Because did you disable any of the compiler warning plans? Because you're talking about static code analysis. The compilers are getting much better. Well, they've been operating with this in SE22, which is under ISO for programming languages. And we're looking at vulnerabilities from the programming languages. And of course, C and C++ are notorious, but even other languages have that as well. So the point is, did you disable any compiler warning? And anyone who said, well, yeah, but there was these reasons, well, to me, that's the equivalent if I was a handgun builder. Uh, that, well, you know, this trigger, it sticks because of the safety switch. Well, I'm going to disable the safety switch and not tell the customer, say, here, just use this handgun. And, and you're responsible for anything that happens with that. Well, that's essentially what's happening when people are disabling compiler warnings. So at least get them to admit if they did that. Or if they did, explain why you think it's okay from a, the enterprise perspective. But what are other questions that we should be asking relative to cloud computing <coughs> and software as a service, platform as a service, name it something as a service or so? You know, we're getting a lot of marketing terms out here. In fact, has anyone seen good definitions for cloud computing? It's like everything that is under the cloud, right? So we, we have to keep that in mind. So if I was to go to an acquisition organization, especially when they said, well, you know, I don't touch software, so I'm not responsible. I've actually seen some <coughs> acquisition program managers tell the developer that the inclusion of tools in your overhead expenses was not allowable. So what does that mean? Well, when I talked to these contractors, they said, well, that meant our management said, we don't get any tools. So you're delivering some of these defense systems and you're only doing manual code inspection. Yeah, because the acquisition manager said it was unnecessary. You understand what we've got? So I'm going to stand back and say, would you recognize a company that could do secure development? We know that every organization has some form, you'd like to think they have some framework to guide their uh, activities. Everyone does plan, design, build, and deploy. Everyone does some form of requirements engineering. And a really good organization, is go independent of customers, is going to be doing some use cases. That's just a good practice. Architecture and detailed design, code and testing, and then we have practices for supporting our fielded systems. And all of these should be found in an organization's, what we refer to as the Organizational Process Asset Library. That provides governance, policy, standards, training, and any tailoring guidelines. The reason you have this is every time you start up a new project, hopefully it's not starting from a blank sheet of paper says, this is the way we do business. As I told you earlier, we don't care where those practices came from. They could have come from standards, models, history. But the point is, your practitioners know that they need to do this. That's great. But now, if you really want to security enhance that, you want to start including risk-based analysis and assessment in this. So the first thing is, in the requirements area, is to include abuse cases. I could literally go to individual developers who weren't thinking about security in the past and say, your software, how could it be abused by a clueless user? How could it be abused by somebody who had malicious intent? And actually, most developers actually can think about that. And they, and they have some ideas about that. But if you formalize that, put people on the front end who've actually been trained in this to be thinking about the environment that you're going to deploy it in, that would be much more effective in building out the requirements for what that is. Yes? I implemented a process that said Motorola. And the 
biggest problem we had was conventional software development processes aren't agent-oriented. And there are no agent-oriented software tools. There is a, a system called Secure Tropus out of Trento, out of Italy. Mm -hmm. And if you go to agent-oriented, uh, agent-oriented agent software design processes will bind you to the, the SOA, and the SOA will bind you to the organization. Then you can do risk mitigation end-to-end on the organization. This is always a human in the loop. The biggest problem yeah. is if you don't nail it down on traceability, it's not my problem. Right, it is. And and one of the things, and by the way, I, there were some developers who will tell me that the customer didn't explicitly tell me that that software had to be secure. <laughs> I know, it, it's the customer's fault because they didn't. That's but the but we, we buy services. We buy large capabilities. I contract with people because they claim to have domain expertise in an area. And for them to say, well, I didn't know that that software had to be secure, it's just like, then you're not really a domain expert. So understand that we're looking at that, that it has to be factored into it up front. And then with the, the same thing with, in design, we want risk-based test plans to be incorporated that so that we literally have testable design, not just the, the way it was built. And we want to be able to still continue with code review. Manual code inspection still is a good thing. Uh, in fact, I will tell you because some of the design flaws are, you can't detect that with tools, so you need manual code inspection. But also, something we learned years ago with the software CNM, peer reviews are still very good, especially if the potential of a malicious insider, if you've got somebody else looking at it along the way, that's, that's a good way of mitigating some of But we're recommending static and dynamic code analysis in the developer's hands, not just the QA or testers. And in some cases, that means you're going to have to bring in some of the free tools. That's great. But some of this, to really do it right, you're going to need the more heavyweight tools. Now, you may only, based on the number of licenses you have, only be able to afford to do it for your testers at first. OK, well, at least get something into the hands of your testers, uh, your, your builders. Because nothing is more frustrating to a programmer who isn't armed with the tools and the guys who are checking and have all those tools. They say, I could have caught that. You know, it's just let them uh, do it there. But also, Penetration testing. A lot of people think in terms of pen testing, something, oh, that's the operational environment. Most of the time, we've got development teams, your development teams, you know the platform, you know the environment it's going to go into. So why not do pen testing in the development side, not wait till it's gone operational? And then security operations and vulnerability management. Do you realize that if you've installed free patches, and, and by the way, the normal reason for doing a patch is not because you're bring, bringing in new functionality, it's because of a security issue. But if you've introduced three patches and not gone back and looked at the design, I contend you probably introduced yet again another security weakness. So keep that in mind. There's practices for every one of these, by the way. We've got documents on all of these for that, that in particular. Building and security, what we've got, the, uh, the documentation is out there. It goes from attack modeling, secure software requirements engineering, secure design principles and practices, Secure programming practices, test and development. So all of this is documented, so you can pick this up and start using that. And we also recognize that we needed to get beyond training, that it had to go into education. So we've literally come out with the software assurance common body of knowledge that is used for educators, and it also includes the security principles and practices. And we've more recently published the masters in software assurance, as long, along with uh, course outlines for undergraduate. And at some of the universities have already picked this up and are starting offering certificate programs and software assurance. So that's why I'll ask the question always about coming back. Because with college-educated people, you'd like to think we, these practitioners are coming out well-informed about that. We're advising people, please, take advantage of these free resources that are available. Start incorporating this. This is not an overnight transformation. There are some companies you'll still hear say, well, you know, that's security. That's going to cost you more. They're absolutely correct, and you know why? Because if they think that just because I pay them more, that tomorrow they'll be secure, that's not right. Because it's gonna take you 18 months just to start transforming this, and it's gonna take you years to really fully embed all this into the way you do business. It's a cultural transformation. Microsoft started doing this years ago, and it literally took Bill Gates having standouts. Now, people will still say, well, it's not 100% secure. Microsoft can measure changes as a result of that and what, how the company's been changing with that for their, the new applications that are coming out. Uh, but you need to be able to modify the software development lifecycle to incorporate security processes and tools, and please involve your practitioners in the selection of tools. Because I, I will tell you, personal history says, well, this is a great tool, and I just gave it to the developers. 
come back six months later, they're not using it. It was a great tool, but they didn't know how to fit it into their workflow. So you have to be able to train them on that, help them in the selection of that. You need to avoid any drastic changes to your existing development environment and allow the change and culture to change over, over time. You need to make the business case for that and retain upper management support. People who are the, the risk holders are the ones who need to be always asking the question to say why that's important. You can go through that, but I will tell you, security is really about key people for providing secure software. Security knowledgeable software professionals, security aware project management, and upper management commitment. That really is very key to what we're being able to do here. You heard earlier today about the Rugged Manifesto. I could go through this and about why it's important. But it really focuses on resiliency and, and survivability. This is no longer a case of, will my code be attacked? It's just a matter of when. And as most of all of you know, your code will live on well beyond you being in an organization. It will be put in ways and put on platforms you never intended. But if we focus on that, so we're looking at that if it's compromised, the damage to the software will be minimized and it will recover quickly to an acceptable level of operating capacity. That's what we mean by being ready. And there are many resources, as I talked about, that you can download and be able to go to. <coughs> but we're advising organizations, not everybody's going to be the same. You need to be able to have these things to be able to understand your business processes. You need to be able to get your organizational support. You need to build and refine and execute on your assurance processes. And you need to be able to measure the results over time. There's guidance in that. In fact, the guidance has come now. We've published the assurance process reference model. It's publicly available. You can use it with the CMMI. You can use it with the RMM, the Resiliency Management Model. You can use it in conjunction with uh, some of the ISO standards. The key is, is to be able to identify those practices and, that are applicable to you, but more significantly, identify the goals. Because every organization should have similar goals in this area of security. But you may have different ways of achieving it. And so we give you recommended, expected practices, but you can still come up with alternative practices to be able to achieve the goal. And you're able to be able to point to which of the sources that it came to. Because I will tell you, some people will say, well, who are you to tell me I need to be doing that? Actually, I will turn, turn it around and say, who are you to say, you shouldn't have to do something that everybody is saying you should be doing these things. And so this becomes internally a decision about what are we doing? Do we start it off? It's a self-assessment. So you can go back to upper management and say, you know, according to these models, we're not doing these things. Oh, we, we should be improved here. And let them make a decision about it, especially if it's a resource allocation issue that comes down to it. So again, the process reference model with the goals and practices. I'm not going to go through that. The, it actually points to OWASP top 10. Uh, when you're able to do that, when you look at the practices that are there, we've used OWASP top 10 as, as an example of practices, so you can point to that. But there's actually other guidance that will come in there, and there is a matrix that says, here's where all the sources are, and you can go to for more information to, uh, on how to implement that. And we're, we're mapping to ISO uh, lifecycle standards for software as well as systems. Specifically, if you go to our website, because uh, we've harmonized the lifecycle standards, and from engineering, the project, and project support processes, all the way to the organization level. And just as an example, uh, verification and validation are in common in all of those. And so we, we basically put material in there on risk-based test finding, security-enhanced test and evaluation, including dynamic and static code analysis, pen testing, and independent <coughs> test and certification activities. We point to and understand there's a rich plethora of international standards that are out there. But we play in the space of those that are most relevant to that to the point that we're evolving those standards. And my intent is not to go through all of those. But one of them that I think is very significant is ISO 15026, which is on system and software assurance. It is about the assurance case. And it's to be used with the other life cycle standards. And it's, the assurance case is about asserting claims based on arguments and evidence that support that. The object management group and ISO actually have this in there, so it's a way that you can literally have suppliers assert claims about safety, security, and dependability of their product. From a consumer perspective, people are going to care about the claim, and so all they're going to understand is that there's an ISO conformant methodology that's behind that claim. A claim is not a warranty or it's not a guarantee, but it's a way of starting to assert features of that product. Yeah? Do you use the OMG We do. Yes, 
In fact, you know what? Let me uh, skip through this because we're coming to the end here. One of, one of the things, that, just to let you know that you're, you may be familiar with SCAP if you've dealt with the federal government, the Secure Content Automation Protocol. We are rolling out a new one, the Software Assurance Automation Protocol, that leverages the common weakness enumeration, the common attack patterns, and now the malware attributes. We're developing a scoring system, the object management group, the all the way from the uh, assurance evidence meta model, the argumentation meta model, the structured metrics meta model, knowledge discovery metrics model. These are all incorporated in this new, what is a use case for automating it. Now understand, this is not 100% automation, but what we're doing is allowing analysts to do the things that they do best for automating those things that we can do that. SCAP is only one of the ways that we do that. I'm going to roll through this. Um, so going to with the object management group, when you were looking at being machine readable, what we've got is uh, an assurance ecosystem that literally has the claims, arguments, and evidence repository. It looks at ways of this is what we are. That's exactly what. So you were asking the question, and it's based on the OMG standards to roll this out. Have you been able to leverage in the European context? We have. We, we do have some of that. And you're right, the Europeans are ahead in some ways with that. They're actually doing it. But we're doing this in conjunction with the Department of Defense, the National uh, Security Agency, as well as NIST, to be able to move this forward so that we can truly start automating what we're doing. But to the point, let me explain this. We, we have challenges in the space that a lot of legacy systems are out there. I've literally gone to some people and said, you know, we can go through and scan your legacy systems and I can tell you where all your exploitable constructs are. And they'll look at me and they'll go, why would I want to know that? You, you understand where they're coming from? Because once I've told them where they are and that they get breached in the future and, they, and it's been known that they knew about it, see, the challenge is many of them don't think they can do anything about it. They don't have the right people to access it. They so have needed the source for a group of people. So what we've done, and through this ecosystem, we've already demonstrated a plug and play of tool. What one static code analyzer will do, another will be able to read that and apply a virtual patch, which is a, either an application firewall or a code wrapper. It doesn't fix the exploitable construct, it blocks the access to it. And, and so you have to understand that. Is it a 100% solution? No, but it's, we have been able to demonstrate that you can get a lot farther with this. So, getting off the stage here, you've heard a lot about the Rugged Manifesto. The things that OWASP is doing is just, just a phenomenal activity. I think as a grassroots activity, OWASP is one of the best things we've got on an international scale. So, do leverage your local chapters. Stay engaged with what they're doing. Or understand that this is something that we're all engaged with. And software supply chain management is a national security and economic issue because our adversaries can gain intimate access to the front end systems, especially in a global supply chain that offers very limited transparency. And so advances in science and technology are always going to be outpaced by the ability of government and industry to react. But we know that national security policies must conform with international laws and agreements while preserving our nation's rights and freedoms and protecting our nation's self-interest and economic goals. Forward looking policies, can adopt to this new world order. International standards must continue to evolve to, and, and mature to better address supply chain issues. And we are doing a new supply chain risk management standard through SA 27. And we know that we need insurance rating schemes for software products and organizations who are delivering those. But we also know that our suppliers and buyers can take more deliberate actions. This is no longer, well, we can't do anything. We actually know we can do things about it to be to security enhance the way you do business. Our processes, practices can and must change. Government and industry both have significant leadership roles in this, and individuals can influence the way their organizations adopt these security practices. Like OWASP, which is a grassroots effort, you can take this to your organization and start implementing it. These things are freely available. It's just a cultural mind shift change that we can make these changes. In addition to OWASP, I invite you to engage our software assurance forum which we meet on a quarterly basis. We, our forum is actually every, uh, on a semi-annual basis. We have working groups in between. It is the working groups that have been delivering this collaboratively developed material that is publicly available. I invite you to go to our website and do that. Consider joining our groups. And I'll be around for questions because I know that we've got to wrap up here for lunch. We'll do that.